All right, so my name is David Agbinyega. Um, just a bit of housekeeping. So my wife is actually nine months pregnant. <laughs> she told me this morning that she's going to try not to crop my style, but in case you see me running out, then it's, it's yeah, probably us. Then, then it's a happy occasion. We yeah, yeah. That's yeah. uh, so why I apologize. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> I apologize in advance. <laughs> um, but so um, I'm going to be introducing Angular today. Um, and uh, I just want to preface that by saying that um, I'm, I'm not going to compare and contrast with React and Vue. A lot of people that I've seen giving this talk tend to do that. Um, that's because I don't know enough about the, those, those things. Um, what I do know is that each of those technologies you know, were created for a specific purpose, and people seem to have strong opinions that are not based on um, like expertise in any one of them. Um, so that's just my, <laughs> my personal opinion. So why did, why did I pick Angular? I'm going to talk about that. Um, and just talk about my experience learning Angular. So uh, for those who may not know, um, I moved to the US in 2016, uh, which is fairly recent. <laughs> and um, at the time, Angular was the rage. Um, there were people who were mad that AngularJS was being discontinued. Um, and then there were people who were excited you know, that um, there was a new language that had all these capabilities. And so, and so fortunately for me, um, I was able to get into a boot camp that um, reintroduced me to web development. Um, I say reintroduced because um, up at that time, up until that point, I had worked as a developer in the past um, with uh, a degree in computer science, a bachelor's in computer science and a master's in supply chain management. And so for me, moving to the US was um, an opportunity to reinvent myself. Um, and what was interesting about the boot camp is that, um, getting dry mouth. Um, what was interesting about the boot camp is I understood most of the concepts that were shared because of my background. But unfortunately for me, I just didn't, did not understand Angular. Um, it was AngularJS that was introduced, um, and it just had just a different way of looking at things. And so it took me quite a bit to just grasp it, um, but by that time I was hooked. Um, and also, you know, moving, moving from Ghana where I worked as, um, I was a country manager of an e-commerce business, um, it, it was, I, I obviously couldn't com um, compete with Amazon coming in, um, and so I did what anyone who um, had a background in you know, programming would do is I wanted to get back in the game. Um, and if you've been uh, fortunate enough to um, be in management, you would know that <laughs> it really tastes like Marmite, you know, unless you like Marmite. Um, so for me, it was a combination of Angular being all the rage at the time and it being fascinating enough. So I have been using Angular for continuously for 15 months. Um, I, was, I was fortunate to um, get a job right out, out of the boot camp. And so since then, I've been working with JavaScript in general. But with regards to Angular, it's been the last 15 months. Because when I got my first job, um, I was told to use you know, jQuery. Also. In my learning, um, I found that it was it was best um, to be able to um, work with what I call greenfield code bases and brownfield code bases. Uh, the difference being that greenfield code bases don't have any dependencies on legacy. Um, for the first company that I worked with, we were fortunate enough to have. Um, the opportunity to write an Angular app from scratch. And what that meant was we were able to actually read the Angular documentation and what it says about best practice um, and actually incorporate this into the code base. Um, unfortunately for me, I'm working currently in a brownfield code base 
Um, and what that means is that the app uh, has been, it was developed over the last two years, but it's so dependent on legacy code bases um, and legacy systems to the point where um, the, the, the developers have had to do certain things for the sake of expediency, uh, not necessarily best practice. But that has been a great experience because it's made me think about the <coughs> ways to refactor it. And so um, just something that I, I would want to share as someone who is new um, learning JavaScript is that when you have the chance to pick up um, a new framework or a new library, it helps to think of your experiments, your code experiments as greenfield, and actually go into GitHub and get, you know, like mature code, like code that other people have written, and, and try to think about how to refactor it, because it certainly helped me. Um, there were cases, there were scenarios where, or instances where I would just search in GitHub for just ran random topics in Angular, and I would get code bases in Spanish, you know. <laughs> I mean, the code is in English, but the annotations and everything else in, is in Spanish. But what that did was help me to um, level up, as, <laughs> as is the, the term these days. Um, now, so this is the outline. So this is what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be talking about Angular from an architectural standpoint, what the various components are. Um, and touch on a brief history of Angular. Um, I'll talk briefly about AngularJS um, and some of the problems that it solves. Um, before I continue, if you have any questions, please feel free to stop me at any time. Um, and then I'll talk about getting started. Um, if you were going to write an Angular application, how exactly would you start? You know. Um, what are the ways in which people get into it? Um, if you have a laptop right now and you, you're interested in just taking it for a spin, what would you need to install? What would you need to, um, you know, get it going? And then um, I would show a brief demo um, showing just some of the different pieces of Angular and how to put an Angular app together. Now, um, and then I'll end with advanced topics. I know this seems like <laughs> a very short list, but we'll go in depth um, as time allows. Um, and again, if you have any questions, feel free to, to ask. So um, according to Stephen <coughs> Fluen, who is an Angular developer advocate, <laughs> I've heard him a few times, and he describes Angular as a platform that <laughs> enables or makes it easy for developers to build web applications. Um, and, and, I showed, and I'm sure this definition, for most people he, who hear it the first time, is very general. Um, but um, it has some key words in there. Um, first of all, Angular is a platform. It is not a library. Um, and personally, that was one of the biggest decisions, I mean, the biggest um, decisions that Google made um, that I think helped the growth of Angular. Um, the reason why they uh, put so much effort into pushing Angular as a platform uh -huh. is they want <coughs> to make it such that when um, people start to use it, they have all the tools, they have um, everything that they would need from the beginning of the developer experience to actually deploying um, applications on the web. And that is very convenient, especially when you have um, a large team. And so with, um, with modern browsers these days, you can think of, you can almost think of them as um, operating systems, okay, within which um, you have the opportunity to build these incredible um, app experiences. And so having a platform that is able to support um, not only writing HTML, but having a CLI that is able to scaffold out your code, that has uh, ready libraries at your disposal um, where you can import and remove things, uh, makes it very easy for especially new developers and people who are new to, to the, the platform. 
Um, um, and also the idea of applications. Um, traditionally, applications, um, the, when you say applications, people think of mobile or desktop. Um, but with Angular, you have the opportunity to build um, apps that are able to function or that are able to be transpiled and bundled for different platforms. And so you can write for a desktop as well as mobile or a website. Um, and that's one of the reasons why some people gravitate, sorry, gravitate towards, towards Angular. Um, and with the web, um, it's very important to recognize uh, the fact that um, writing applications nowadays um, has a lot of considerations uh, to take. It, there, there are a lot of considerations. Um, you have to think about whether or not your users will always have the internet available to them, how slow or fast the connection is. Um, and so Angular has, uh, th th there's this idea of PWAs now that are becoming very popular. And the idea is to have a progressive web app that is able to work with or without an internet connection. Um, and I'll talk about that briefly. So, um, a small history lesson. So, Angular JS is the first attempt at what is currently Angular. Now, it's uh, it was released in 2009 um, by Misko uh, Hivri, and um, it's currently in long-term support, um, which means that it's slowly being phased out. And there's a security flaw in its latest branch. Um, and, and what that means is that um, <coughs> with some browser, recent browser upgrades um, that are, I think, that have been recently developed and put into production, um, some Angular apps already in production are crashing or will um, have a bug that makes them crash. And also, I think uh, jQuery um, introduced um, an upgrade that, that makes you know, this branch of AngularJS crash. And I put 2021 there because that is when AngularJS is scheduled to be put to rest. Um, and so if you are <coughs> working in a company that uses AngularJS, you might want to consider you know, probably um, switching that for something else. Um, now, um, one of the things that AngularJS popularized was the idea of single page applications. And I'm sure if you're familiar with um, web development or <laughs> websites, you, you've probably seen this before. Um, so on the left is the traditional web page. And what, what um, single page applications did was to change the way communication happens between a client and a server. And so when an initial request is made um, in a traditional web page, you have um, an HTML um, page with assets being brought back with every request. Okay, whenever a request is sent, you have images, you have assets, sometimes they are cached, sometimes they are not um, brought back. Now with single page applications, with the first initial request, what you get is um, an HTML, um, an HTML page that <laughs> is going to be the container for what would be your app. So your app is going to live within that HTML page for the life of the application. And what that has done is make for some very um, amazing capabilities and faster response times. And so. Um, when you, especially when you have a slow, a slow network, you don't have to um, be waiting for page loads as much. And, and if you have um, an app that is, um, that is progressive, um, that's the term used, even when the network is slow, you can do, s there, there is some functionality that is afforded to you. 
Now, so let's come to uh, the, the present. So Angular um, is written in TypeScript. That is the biggest difference between Angular and AngularJS. Um, I know that people still confuse the two, but they are very different languages. Um, now, TypeScript is a superset of Angular, and so you, you, you can still write Angular with JavaScript. Um, with the exception of how um, Angular handles dependency injection, which I'll explain, um, everything else can be written in JavaScript. And so if you know JavaScript, there's no reason to, to learn <laughs> TypeScript. But if you are familiar with uh, languages like Java or C Sharp, it's pretty easy to, to look at TypeScript code and understand what's happening. Um, so, you know, TypeScript introduces ideas like classes, inheritance, um, accessors, it has generics. Um, it, it has all the, all the things that, you know, especially backend developers are used to. Um, and it's a strongly typed language. Um, and that is important because um, with, um, with API calls and reactive programming, you want to be sure about what is coming back from the server. When you make a request, you want to know the shape of your JSON object that is being returned. Um, and so um, there, are, there are big advantages to using TypeScript. But like I said, if, you, if you're someone who is very good with JavaScript and you want to keep it that way, you can still do that. Do that. Um, <coughs> As of the time I um, put this together, the latest version was 7.3.1. That tends to change almost every month. And so there are upgrades that are happening. Now 40% of, um, sorry, uh, Angular is actually open source, and 40% of that code is attributed to the open source community. And that is very significant. Um, it's significant because it's, it introduces a level of transparency that um, ensures also security. And when uh, the, the process for merging code is, is unique in the sense that when you introduce a pull request or you introduce a feature, Google actually runs your, your change against 700 internal projects. And so Google Cloud, Google Shopping, Firebase, is supported by Angular, and so and, and they are all on the latest versions of Angular. And so that adds some surety to um, the language. I know that there are a lot of people who are a bit nervous when it comes to adopting open source. Um, in, in United Show Where <coughs> I Work, uh, we have a, a committee that meets to discuss um, new languages and tools that people want to introduce. And so people are still very <laughs> nervous about adopting open source into their code bases, but you have at least some comfort knowing that there are projects um, that are in production, 700 in Google that, you know, that support the language. So and the, the, we're going to talk about the Angular architecture. Um, so before I go on, who is familiar or has worked with <coughs> Angular at all? Okay. Two people? <laughs> Work with Angular. Okay. So these are the main building blocks of Angular. Um, and when I, when I started learning it, um, it, it was an uphill battle just understanding some of the terms um, used. But um, with time, um, what, what happened was um, when you're working in code bases and you're picking off tickets, um, you, you have no option but to actually read up on stuff. And so um, I'm going to be sharing um, the features of these languages, um, sorry, the, the features of the different parts of Angular. Um, but I know that if you're familiar with it, there are things that you can do and there's, I've seen that there's people who have extended um, these main building blocks. So modules. So modules are kind of like the way in which Angular applications are grouped. 
So they are grouped according to, you can group your app according to a set of capabilities. Um, you can group them according to a workflow. You can group them um, in terms of um, in, in terms of your basically an internal architecture. And so when you are um, writing your, your Angular application, it helps to spend some time thinking about the overall structure of the app. Now modules contain um, components, service providers, routes, and files defined um, by the module. So these are the, the sub components that live within the module's scope. Um, as, and one of the advantages of thinking of your app in terms of modules is Angular allows you to lazy load parts of your app. And what that means is you have parts of your app that are loaded on demand. And so I mentioned previously that um, when you make a request, what you get is one HTML document. Now when you write your application with load, lazy, load, lazy loading in mind, what can happen is perhaps there are parts of your app that not everybody um, needs right, on the initial load. And so those parts of the app can be um, just basically you know, relegated to, um, to being loaded when needed. And so that speeds up initial load um, and it makes it, it makes it possible, it, it makes it such that your bundle size is actually much smaller. Um, with modules, you can actually import functionality from other modules. And so if you build your Angular app um, by separating out different functions, you can have one function importing from another function or another um, importing functionality from another module. And what happens in that scenario is your module would actually export those components that are needed you know, in the components in which you need it in, or you want it in. Does that make sense? And so this is an example of how you might structure your application. So I, I actually took this layout from LinkedIn. So LinkedIn has a big header, it has profile and links, updates in the middle, and then news and other um, ads. I actually misspelled that, um, ads. But, um, so you can actually think of this, these are simp uh, different modules with distinct functionality. Um, and when you're building out your module, you can also actually have um, core modules, and these are according to the Angular style guide, these are modules that, um, modules that are not only shared, um, sorry, modules that have single um, use cases that are, um, that are, what's the word, um, common to your entire application. And so you can think of something like authentication as something that you can put in your core module. Um, you can actually also create a shared module that has components, services, and features that all these modules um, can use. So we'll talk about components. Um, so um, an Angular component is, in, in basic terms, is a template with logic, right? Um, and it forms part of your DOM tree. So whether you know it or not, if you're building a web page or a web application, you're, comp you're composing a node or uh, you're composing a DOM tree. And so this is an example of a template. And so templates in Angular are uh, declarative. And um, one of the things that is strange when you start using Angular or looking at Angular code <coughs> is you see all these um, custom you know, nodes. Um, and so that's one of the uh, capabilities of Angular. Or that's one of the unique things about Angular is it helps you to create high level views that contain uh, sub nodes. Um, and so if you look at something like this, you can see 
uh, the mug card uh, node and that is actually a component on its own with a selector mug uh, card um, so mug list item would be a component mug list would also be a component a separate component and you can see how uh, components are nested with this piece of code so next we talk about directives um, so directives change the, the appearance or structure of your, uh, your DOM tree, right? Um, they can also change the behavior. And so if you look at the example that I have there, um, I have um, a highlighting directive called mug highlight. Um, and you will notice also with the, so you, you'll notice um, an at sign with the keyword directive there. And what that is, so that isn't an Angular thing. It's a TypeScript um, decorator. Um, if I think there are, there are other languages that also have decorators. And what decorators do is they give your class metadata, so extra information that the compiler needs in order to identify a component um, <coughs> um, and um, associates the component with other components. Um, and the decorator also is a way for you to inject extra data, not just metadata, but actual data um, into your code. Um, and so there are two main types of uh, directives. There is the attribute directive and the structural directive. Structural directives um, add or remove parts of your DOM node. So um, you can have if statements in your template, um, um, or you can, sorry, you can control visibility of a node with a structural directive. An example is an ng if. Um, you can actually iterate over an array in your um, in your node as iterate over an array and display the contents with a structural directive. And you can also write your own custom directive. So you can display something based on a condition. So you can have something like um, an unless X condition directive so that something is displayed um, until a certain condition is met. Uh, there are different ways to, to, um, to use directives. Now components are also directives, but the difference is that they have templates. Something else about this, and so when you when you take a look at the example code, you notice that um, the directive is mostly just logic. It doesn't have um, a lot of HTML in it. It's specifically grabbing a node um, with what is called the element ref. Now, element ref is part of the Angular library. It's something Angular gives you. It's part of so it's sort of like an API. And so what that gives you is access to an entire node. And so in this instance, it will give you the entire uh, P, P node. Um, and <coughs> you can change the background color of the paragraph element. So services. So services um, are the data layer of Angular applications. Um, if you look at the Angular sa uh, style guide, um, so they describe services as anything that has um, responsibility for discrete pieces of functionality. So I mentioned that your component has logic um, and controls a view, but we want the component to be 100% focused on um, the view. And so everything the component is doing has to be manipulating the view in some way or form. So anything that isn't doing that, any logic that is not doing that, logic that is grabbing data from a remote server, um, transforming that data and injecting it, um, or transforming that data should be relegated to a service. Um, and the interesting thing about services is that they are singletons. Um, yes. Services aren't singletons. Services can pick the 
global services are sort of been spread all over the places so that are put in the components are just one, one point down. I'm sorry, say that again. So you have a component and you have a bunch of children on it. So you have a list component and you wanted all the children items in that list to have access to the same service or service that's managing the data in that list or some function on the list. You would put the service um, inside of the, uh, the parent, the list component, and that would be available to all of the children list items. But the reason that's important is if I have two lists, each list can have their own service, which means it's not a single thing, because a single thing there can only be one instance for your entire application, unless my definition of single thing is wrong, which may be. So your, your definition of single things is correct, but um, so one way to look at it, I, I do still maintain that singletons, uh, sorry, services are singletons, but a way to look at it is when you, you have the option of, um, depending on your use case, um, share an instance of a service with a group of components. And so the, the main design purpose of singletons is to make sure that um, your your logic class and its sort of uh, its properties are um, what's the term are shared, um, but also sort of you're you're trying to keep the integrity of that data set within the within the singleton, and so Angular allows you to inject a single instance of it, but you, depending on the use case, you can create a different instance, right? Depending on how you inject it. And that's how the dependency injection works. But I think the primary purpose of services, if you look at the style guide, is that they are singletons, or they were created to be singletons. So the, the way they work in a general sense is um, when you look at the, and, and, and I'll show that when I create a scaffold of an Angular app, <coughs> is you have an app component, which is your root component. I'm sorry, your root module. Now, every module has an injector, and that injector is responsible for um, providing components of a module with an instance of a service. And so you could um, theoretically um, say that, okay, I don't want the root components instance, I want my own instance. And so in that sense, you can, you can um, instantiate a new service instance and use that separately. But the main purpose of services is that, you know, you, you want to keep that single mm -hmm. instance. Is that? It, it seems okay. like there's a lot of confusion on this because I looked up Stack Overflow just, just for grins and it, it is a singleton. You're correct. It's just the way that they're using it. Uh, it's passed around a lot, so it's one single instance that's passed around to multiple. Yes. Instances. What's the definition of a singleton? Maybe I'm off on this. That's. <laughs> I'm going to get back to this. And so, I mean, a, a singleton in the, in the sense, in the strict sense of the word, is to make sure that you have, you're using just a single instance, and you're sharing the properties of that instance. Um, so, for example, if you have uh, different, if you have different printers, right? You you want each printer to share all the printers in a network to share. Um, is it a spool, like a, a driver? And so that instance of the driver would be a singleton. Um, you don't want it spinning up multiple instances; otherwise, there will be confusion. So. Um, a noteworthy quote from the Angular style guide is um, that you need to try and limit your logic to a comp um, in a component to only what is required <coughs> for the component's view. Everything else should go into the to go into the service. So I'll talk briefly about routing, um, and then we'll talk about getting started. Um, so. Routers allow your application to respond to state changes. So when you're navigating throughout the app, um, routers allow you to 
um, know the state, the current state of the app, and um, change your components and the components' behavior um, based on that. And so you use routers to manage the states. Now I mentioned lazy loading. And so the example I have there shows um, a little bit how lazy loading can be implemented. And so what it's showing is that when you have, um, when you navigate to the root of your web page, um, we are saying that it should load the children from the dashboard. Now the reason why that is a string and the rest are components is the way Angular interprets that is, it interprets that as a, uh, uh, as a different sort of HTML page or a different module that it needs to fetch. Um, and so you will see other paths and the components that are associated. And so the first, the first path <coughs> and the, the URL to that path or the component that is lazy loaded there is an entire module. And then the rest are just components. And so you can have component views that actually you know, have all the functionality that you need. Um, it's also worth noting that you can configure your routes with authentication guards. Um, so what those do is they sort of um, federate access to different parts of the application. And so um, if you, for example, went to the dashboard route and you didn't have access, the auth guard would redirect you to a login page, as an example. And so I, I will be showing an example application. And so this is something that I thought about um, when, when I was thinking about the way in which we, um, we sign in when we come here. And so this is something that tries to, so what I did was I tried to envision how we would do that on a web page. So basically you would search for your name, you would press enter and you would be, at, you'd be added to a list of attendees. Um, that was just a basic um, idea. I, I didn't want to do like a, um, another to-do <laughs> to -do list app. Um, but I, I cheated a bit. Um, there are parts that are not fully functional and, and what I have there is just a list. I'm sorry, just a, a, um, a paragraph. So let's talk about how um, you would get started with Angular. There are two ways in which um, most people interact with Angular. One is Stack Blitz. Um, Stack Blitz is a very good way to sort of get your feet wet with Angular, and I will demonstrate that briefly. Now, when you go to st uh, Stack Blitz, it actually gives you um, an Angular a scaffolding of an Angular application, and you can play with it um, and see uh, the effects instantaneously. Another way that, you know, um, especially for people who are new to Angular, um, sorry, um, another way to interact with Angular or to create Angular applications is with a CLI. Now you would need um, Node and NPM to be able to use the Angular CLI, and so those are the dependencies. But with Stack Blitz, you don't need to actually install anything. So if you have your laptop, you can actually check it out um, right now whenever you're free. So I, I will briefly demonstrate what you can do with, with Stack Blitz and the CLI. Now, these are what I call some advanced concepts. Obviously, for some people, these are <laughs> not advanced. But um, what I've tried to do is to present sort of like the fundamentals of the different pieces of an Angular application. Lazy loading and tree shaking is something that I consider you know, um, an advanced topic because there are a lot of people who still don't do that. Um, who still don't think it's even necessary. Um, and I've worked in code, code bases where over 100 modules um, are actually in the, in, in, the, in the app module. And so when you load the app, you're loading everything. Um, authentication using guards um, is something Angular also provides. Um, when, you are, when you're starting with this, there's quite a lot of boilerplate that goes into 
uh, setting up authentication with guards, depending on what um, tools you're using to set up authentication. Now, Angular makes it um, easy for you to decide, okay, I don't want to go with the what, what Angular provides, I want to use um, or, or I want to use like Auth0 or anything else. So you can um, definitely work with third party tools. Um, Angular allows you to do end-to-end -end testing um, and they provide that um, out of the box. And so if you spin up a new Angular code base, you would have Karma, you would have Protractor um, ready to use. Dependency injection. So dependency injection is how Angular makes services available to your different components. Um, and so the way you do it is you, um, you would inject um, a service in the constructor of your component and immediately have, have access to that service. And we'll see that shortly. Uh, state management and reactive programming is also something that um, Angular uh, provides to an extent. Now, RxJS comes with Angular. Um, and it's something that um, I think will be good for another talk because it's an entire subject on its own. And so with that, I would demonstrate um, some of Angular's capabilities with the CLI. Um, but first, let me just show you what Stack Blitz looks like. Uh, no, don't go there. Is RxJS unique to Angular, or is it a separate library altogether? Um, it's a separate library. Um, okay. RxJS, it, it is a separate library. It has different flavors, and so there's Rx Java, there's Rx Scala, okay. you know, and so, um, yeah, you can, so you can. It's for, it's, looks like it's for reactive programming? Yes. Okay. And so this is Stack Blitz. Um, once you click on Angular, you immediately spin up an Angular application. And so this, this gets you basically coding, right? You have everything you need to test an idea, to play around with the language, and see what it can do. Um, of course, this is the minimal build, um, but um, it basically has everything that you would need to run an Angular app. Now, in any Angular app, you would see a package.json, and so these are this file holds all the dependencies that your Angular application might need. Uh, the the dependencies are divided into just dependencies that will be bundled into your final build of your Angular application, and then dependencies that you will need during development. And so these are dependencies <coughs> that you see in, in the bottom. And if you're using the Angular CLI, um, it gives you scripts for serving, building, testing, and linting your application. And so all of this is available. <coughs> Now, your main configuration file for Angular uh, would be your angular.json file. And this is where you can add, uh, you can do some configuration, you can add schematics. And schematics are a way for you to provide, um, provide extra functionality to the CLI. And so for third party tools, as an example, um, third party tools can have in the schematic a way to modify your app. And so I'll show that <coughs> when I'm using the CLI briefly. Um, and so with, with this, you can, uh, you can make changes immediately. You can start editing, and you see it happen um, immediately. I did make a mental notes to do that, I just forgot. Um, and so what this shows you is um, just a, a basic um, scaffold of an Angular application. Um, I will just go to the Angular CLI and demonstrate how you would use the CLI. Um, is this big enough? So, um, 
the Angular CLI allows you to um, basically not only create your Angular application, but creates the different components or parts and pieces of the CLI. And so for example, um, ng is how we, we use Angular in the CLI. Um, ng new help shows us um, what this uh, function does, right? And so with it, we can create a new workspace, we can create a new app, and we can actually add all these uh, sort of extra configurations in the command line. Um, it's very simple to use, and it's, um, I think the goal of this is to reduce the, the barrier, barrier to entry, um, especially for new people. So I found this very helpful. And so to create a new Angular application, we would do ng-new. Uh, the name of the app, the app would be, uh, let's say, mug, um, mag app. And just let's use the default configuration. So from the get-go, you see what this gives us. So one of the things that I think the Angular team or the Google team that worked on this decided to do is they wanted to give developers everything, right? And so if you're working as a single developer who is starting to build Angular apps um, and, and your app becomes wide, uh, wildly successful and you grow to, let's say, 300 developers, um, it gives you everything that the developers would need. And so if you have QAs on your team, QAs would be interested in uh, your testing files and your units, unit tests and end-to-end -end testing. If you have architects in your team, the architects will be thinking about how to compose the different aspects of the app, and the developers can focus on individual components. I was trying to stop because this, <laughs> this, this takes a while. Um, so if we go into our Mac app. So I'm going to open this in Visual Studio um, so that we see this better. So starting from the bottom, um, we have. So th this is this is what Angular gives us when we start it up. Um, I'm just going to go very quickly through the uh, the parts so that you understand what what it's doing. Uh, TS Lint allows you to set up rules for linting. Some people prefer uh, double spacing um, to force. Sorry, uh, double. Is it single indentation to double indentation and all of that? So this allows you to create rules um, so that the team is on one page. Um, it prevents infighting <laughs> amongst teams. Um, your TS config is for your Angular compiler, um, and these are the rules for, sorry, it's for your TypeScript compiler. And so these are the rules um, for TypeScript. Again, um, I mentioned that Angular is written in TypeScript. And so what happens is you would write your application in TypeScript and it will get transpiled um, into JavaScript um, and then bundled up into your disk folder for serving. You have your readme, you have your package.json, which I've mentioned. Um, I've also talked about this. You have your git ignore files. Now this is what the source looks like. Um, Now when you start your Angular application or you start running the application, this is the first file that Angular uses to bootstrap the rest of your app. Now there's a, a bunch of stuff on here that is not very necessary um, for beginners like the environment. So this is basically say that saying that we should enable production in production mode and what that does is it turns off um, your change detection behavior. And so in development mode, <coughs> Angular does change detection um, in two iterations. So it, it will basically check for changes to your views. And if there are any changes, reload. But um, it would do a second check. And so this doesn't happen in production. Um, so we can take it off. I just, just want to leave the important pieces just to illustrate um, what Angular needs to start up. So this is all Angular needs to actually start your app. Um, let me save this and run it. Ng serve. Um, let me do 
just to open. Same unknown option P. I did not use a P. Oh, probably, yeah. And so when you when you serve the app, this is what you get. Um, and I'll show you how it gets to this. And so in your main.ts, the app module is your entry point. So the app module it is what loads, and the app module determines which document or which component loads first. And so what you're seeing on the web page is coming from one component, which I'll show briefly. Now I mentioned early on as well that when you go to an Angular page, um, your index.html so when the initial request is made your index.html is is what is served okay and I, I'll come back to this but in the app module So the, the app module is the starting point for your Angular app. Um, and the app, the Angular uses decorators, like I said earlier, to supply metadata to your application. And so your module has um, this object that has declarations. Declarations are the, the components that the module is going to need. Um, so if you have any sub-components, um, in your module, all your components will be in your declarations file. Your browser module is an Angular library module that basically has um, functionality for uh, browsers, it's specific to browsers. Now the cool thing about um, VS Code is that VS Code gives you um, not only syntax highlighting, but it also um, is, the Angular team has worked with the VS Code team um, and so you get access to do the documentation, basically, when you hover over the different parts. Um, providers are where you put your services. And so if your, um, your module needs a list of services, you can optionally provide them in here. Or um, in the service class itself, you can indicate which module the service uh, should be instantiated for. So Angular. Most, almost all Angular com, um, components are basically just classes. And you can see that this is an e empty class. It's not really doing anything. All it's actually doing is bootstrapping your app component. And so let's take a look at the app component real quick. Um, your app component, your app component is made up of about four files. Um, so this is the TS file that provides the logic and what the only thing we are doing here is um, indicating our um, title app and the the decorator allows us to um, provide extra metadata that the component needs and so your selector your selector is how you um, you name your nodes, so your custom nodes and the nodes that I indicated before, um, you would declare that in a selector. Your template URL is where your template is, go is, it is right? Um, your style URLs as well um, is just an array. Now you can actually replace this with, um, with either actual CSS, you can do inline CSS, Through your styles, uh, we can say body and give it a background color. Okay, 
making sure. Uh, did I not use a good color? Okay, I'll come back to that. Um, but you can basically put your uh, your styles in there and separate them. Um, you can have inline HTML as well, and I'll demonstrate that in, in the actual application, the actual demo. Um, so I'm going to open up the demo app. I'll close this so that we can focus on this. In my package.json, um, I, in, I introduce, uh, I modify a script and introduce um, a new script called server. Now there's uh, an NPM package called JSON server and what that does is it creates like a fake server on your machine. And so we can run the server as well as the uh, application at the same time with ng start. If I can get this to So while this loads, I will go through what I've done. So what I'm attempting to do with this app is to just show you how the different pieces of an Angular application come together. And so this is our app module. Um, our app module is importing modules and importing components, right? Um, and so we have a core module in there, and that's the only custom module that I've created. I've also created an attendee <coughs> count, an attendee item, and a, an attendee list at the root level of the application. And that's something you can see um, when you open. I'll, I'll make this available on GitHub um, shortly. And so the attendee list is a component with subcomponents um, or nested components. And then we have our core module and all our core module d does is um, to take care of our header. Let's see, this is compiled. I'll show you the app briefly. And so it doesn't look great, but this was my attempt um, at quickly putting something together. So uh, what I described earlier on was um, to be able to just search for a name um, and then basically search for a name, uh, select the name, and have the name added. Um, this is something that I unfortunately broke this afternoon. Um, I'm still trying to figure out why it's not working. Um, but I'll show you all the different parts. So in our ng module, um, we are bootstrapping our app component. And when we go to our app component, we'll see all the various aspects that make up the component. So this is the entire app, right? Um, we are saying that it should show us that it should, we are pulling in the, the header, <coughs> we are pulling in a title, and this is just a bunch of HTML, but we also have an attendee list. So we are, make, we are using two components in our app at the root level. And at the, we are using two components at the root level, but if you look at the HTML file that is requested, um, we only have just a tiny bit of code. So this is our mug root. And our mark root is our, um, our app component. So if we look at the TS file, we are basically saying that when the application starts, it should <coughs> grab our application component, um, and everything else should be injected into the application component. But when we look at the index.html, What we see is the mug root, but we also see a bunch of scripts here. 
Now, what Angular does when it bundles our code is all, all of our code, all, all the HTML and uh, JavaScript that we've written is in this um, section. So it uses something called Webpack um, to bundle up the code um, and then present it in here as uh, JavaScript. And so the Angular compiler is basically um, outputting a series of JavaScript instructions. And so in our app component, we have the header. And the header is in our call module. And remember that we are injecting that one call module into our app module. And so I'm going to show you what the component is doing. Now, I mentioned that we, ha we can have our templates in line. And so this is what it looks like. Um, I'm using Bootstrap just for styling. And I'm basically uh, displaying the logo um, as a read-only URL. And so this is a TypeScript um, template. And so most and all the components are going to look like this. And so when the um, Angular uses what is called um, lifecycle hooks to spin up different components. And so on, on init, it runs um, our search service. Our search service gets attendees. Um, and so I mentioned that any logic that is not needed for the header or this particular component is, is delegated to the search service or to the service. In our call module TS file, you can see all the modules that we are importing. Now, I wrote uh, two modules um, that I am importing into the call module, uh, the search module and the material module. Um, just to demonstrate um, how you would refactor um, a simple, you know, or a large Angular application. And so by, by building your functionality in different modules, you can swap out modules as, as needed. Um, so in this instance, I'm importing two modules and I'm declaring the header component. And the reason, so the header component is, um, it belongs to the core module, is the only module that I am exporting, or the only component that I'm exporting in the exports um, key. So if I wanted to export the search module and use it in my calling component, <coughs> I would put it in the exports array. So in my call module is where I have my search service. And so this is what the service looks like. So there, I, I also mentioned when I was talking about services that there are two ways in which um, you can provide services or instances of services. One of the ways is to do it through the injectable using the provided in key or um, an object with a key called provided in. And you can indicate the module you want to provide, uh, the, the module that you want to make the service available to or you can use the roots keyword as a string. And what that does is it provides this service at the root level of your application. And so if we look at this, so we have um, properties or member, member variables for our uh, service that handle the URL um, <coughs> read only property. And we have a file, sorry, we have a, a function called get attendees that basically makes an HTTP call. Now, Angular provides us with an HTTP um, client module that we can inject into our code. And this is how um, injection by constructor happens. So construct, constructor injection is, allows you to include a static instance of your service and immediately have access to it. And so um, the way we're using it is that we're using the this, this keyword that indicates that it's become part of our service. And we are using the, um, the different class, sorry, the different methods that um, the HTTP module provides. And so we are able to do put, we're able to do get, um, um, and, and make API calls in our service. 
And so what I'm doing using JSON server is basically to fetch data from, from my DB JSON. Um, and so th this is like a fake server um, and with data. And so I'm just basically making a request for all the attendees in this data. I was actually hoping that this section would be more interactive, so if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. Um, Um, you can, you can. Um, you, so you can do it both in the browser and in the code base. Um, let me see, where would we do something like that? We could. Now, the TS lint is telling us that this is not allowed, right? You're after the return statement. It's not going to run. Oh, yeah, yeah. to see where we're using it. And so this is how it would work. Um, and the browser allows us to see um, what it's doing. It allows us to see what is being returned. And so on initialization, we see that we don't have anything in our code, and we can actually walk through the code. Is that what you're asking? Yes, you can follow it, um, and it allows you to see the scope of the different parts. Um, that's the transpile uh, JavaScript, though, or TypeScript, right? That uses maps. It uses maps, exactly. Uh, and so another way to actually do that, do the same thing, is to go to your sources, and uh, let's search for, we can search for our attendee list component. Where's the TS file? Um, and we can do the same thing here as well. Um, you refresh the page, it would, if this part of the code is, <coughs> is a, a, a critical path or a path, it would allow you to see what's happening. Any other questions? So let's take a look at our search module. So I have two search modules in the application. The first one uses an, a third party library and I wanted to show how you would do that. And so the way you do that is to use NPM to actually install your third party. And so your third party code and all your, your external libraries actually live in your node modules file. Sorry, your load, node modules folder. Anyone who has done any Node.js you know, you, you're familiar with the huge <laughs> node modules folder. And so I'm using a, a library called um, ng2 completer module that I installed using NPM. And that's something I'm importing into my search module. Now I'm also using, Angular has a library called material, um, material that, that provides um, UI components that you can use within your application. It comes with styling and behavior and best practice. If you go to the material.angular.io uh, website, you see what um, you see all the components that Angular provides, and you can also use that in the code. And so I'm just going to show how I'm using this particular module. And so. Um, NG2 Completer allows, gives us access to um, 
just search functionality and auto completion. And so in this instance, um, it allows me to basically grab uh, my attendees from my API and use its internal data service to actually search through that list. And so the way it does that is to provide me with um, these attributes, and these attributes hold data. So it has an internal data service um, with methods that I can use in my code to provide it with uh, the list of my um, attendees. Right? And what it's doing here is on, on initialization, I'm getting my attendees um, and I'm assigning, um, I'm putting the array of attendees in search data um, and this is um, what type checking allows you to do. So type checking ensures that I'm actually getting an array of attendee. Now their data service <coughs> is where the magic happens. So if you're using ng2 completer, what, what happens is if, if I hover over this, you can see exactly what this function is doing. So this function takes my data as an array on, or an observable. It takes search fields um, and title fields um, and it returns local data. And so I'm basically saying that it should just search using the full name, right? Now, for some reason, this, this is what I broke this morning. Um, the, the idea and what I was trying to do was that when an event um, which is selected is emitted, I want to call my function in attendance. And all I'm basically doing is grab the, the um, uh, object that has been selected and updates the attendee. Now I can do control click and go to my service um, function that is doing this. And I'm basically saying that I should mm -hmm. update It's like, okay, I see where the problem is now. Okay, so <laughs> what, what I was trying to do was update the um, is checked in um, Boolean value to true. And I think I didn't complete that. But you basically get what it's trying to do, right? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's go back. And so what I'm, I'm basically passing is my original object. Um, and what I was hoping was to use the objects, put in the objects dot checked in. I, I don't like doing live coding because I always get flustered <laughs> when I do um, with my um, <coughs> Um, and so th this was what I was trying to achieve. I actually don't know if this works. It's always Does my... Does it check the, uh, the types and the templates in that, that you're putting in there, the, the uh, curly braces and whatnot? So this is using string interpolation, so these right. are values. Okay. Um, so my this dot URL is actually um, right here. Right, okay. And it's of type string. I use type checking to, to do that, and so you're doing that in your logic. But um, string into so a anything I put in curly braces um, is is run as an expression, and so I can put at, uh, JavaScript expressions in my um, string, uh, my curly braces. Any other questions? Yeah. So uh, what's involved in installing? So th there are different. There are a lot of <laughs> a lot of ways to answer that, um, but uh, let's let's uh, let's pretend that you have a server that you want to write this on. So you basically um, run your ng build, and what what happens when you run a ng build is your entire code is transpiled um, from TypeScript to JavaScript, and Webpack is used to bundle that. 
and it puts it in a dist folder. So your dist folder um, has all your code, right? Where, where do you get ng from? Where do I get? ng from. Yeah. If I type ng build on my computer, it's going to spit back ng. You have to install yarn. You have to install it. Install so, so um, I, I, I stated that um, for you to be able to run this locally, you need npm. Um, and then you need your node mod, your node, and also you need your Angular CLI. And so I'm using the Angular CLI. And the way you install the Angular CLI is to simply run um, npm install Angular slash CLI. Um, and if you have npm, this would work. Right? I already have it, and so there's no <laughs> need when running. You're, when you're When you're running the, when, when you're building this thing and running this application, uh, it's a single page app, like, like you showed in your slide. Yes. What is the server end of it? Is that Node, or is it Apache, or end of it? It can be. It can be any any backend you want. Um, that, anything that not, serves. That's not Angular. That's whatever your backend is. Whatever your backend is, and so what you're doing is you're hosting this dist folder. Whatever is in <coughs> this dist folder is what you're serving as your final code, your final bundle. Um, and Angular also has Angular Universal, by the way. And so Angular Universal allows you to, um, to pre-compile your code and serve it. So the same way PHP works. And so it, it, um, in runtime, it runs your code um, and then serves up your dynamic data. Am I getting that right? I haven't I haven't tried Angular Universal myself. How is that different from Alexa? How is is it creating native components like uh, React Native, or is it just kind of doing everything Alexa on its own? And I don't know the answer. That you mean way. Angular Universal? Yeah, Angular Universal. So Angular Universal does server side rendering, but Electron wraps. So Electron would wrap what is your Angular code in your disk folder and interface with the desktop. And so if, if you're using something like Slack, Slack is written in um, Electron. Um, what else is written in Electron? Microsoft Teams, does anybody use Microsoft Teams? It's also written in Electron. Um, and so Electron acts as a wrapper that has libraries that interface with your, your native desktop environment. So you say Universal runs on the server? It runs on the server. It it does require Node, I believe, because it has yes, it has the binaries um, to do that. <coughs> but um, you can go to the Angular documentation and um, you get all the information you need. So yes, back to this. So this so the code has finished building, and this dist folder has um, all my assets and all the code that I need to run. Now, be, I'm using, so when you install the Angular CLI and you run ng-sev, Angular is using Webpack. Um, and so Webpack mm -hmm. creates like a, a virtual um, server, a, a, a runtime environment that serves your application for you. But if you wanted to put this on a server and actually put it in production, <coughs> this is how you would do it. Yes, and so when you when you make your initial request, your index.html file is what is served. Right, this is what comes back to your browser. Now we you notice that when I showed the source code for the the HTML, the you didn't see any um, JavaScript. You saw some JavaScript files, references to JavaScript files on here. Let me show you that. So again, how do I take this off? 
So these JavaScript files are not in our index.html. Um, so when Angular bundles up the code um, and, and serves it up, it basically injects this. And so this is what Webpack um, is serving to us. And so if I go to my sources, uh, sources tab, I can see all the files that Webpack is making available and I can look at the code. And so all of these are the set of instructions, set of JavaScript instructions that form my TypeScript code. And so my TypeScript code is transpiled into this. This is what the user is interacting with, not the TypeScript that I wrote. Looks like it's still using jQuery there. It is. Yeah, um, yeah it's a dependency okay. for Webpack. <coughs> Any other questions? I'm actually bummed out that this did not turn out well. I would, before I close, I will show just the attendee list tree briefly. Um. So this is my, yes. Okay, so th this is my um, uh, attendee list, and what I'm doing is I have uh, a tree of components. So I have the count, and then I have the item, right? Um, and I'm using, And list component, and this is the sorry about that. This is the HTML for attendee list, and it has two components in it. Um, this shows me my total attendees by way of property binding. So Angular is using the ang angle brackets to give me data. So I'm getting data from the um, the logic of the attendee count component and the attendee count component is using an angular directive called the input to provide that so I'm basically using the logic to say that um, it should filter through the attendees and any at and any attendee that has a, a boolean value of true um, is actually checked in and so it should return the number of total attendees that are checked in that's what this is doing Any more questions? <coughs> okay. Um, thank you very much. If you would, please, 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 please fill out the comment cards that I have spoken about earlier that are so 